So our theme, as you all know, 2021, to the ends of the earth. And the scripture verse that we have is Acts 13, verse 47. And let me read that to you. For the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may be an instrument of salvation to the ends of the earth. And there are three basic elements in that very short, simple, but full uh, verse, you know, the impactful uh, word of God. And first, that we are a light to the Gentiles, to the nation. Second, that we would be an instrument of salvation. And third, that this work would be to the ends of the earth. And we all know, as we have known all of these years, as the Lord has uh, convicted us and placed in our hearts that this is very, very crucial work. Why? For the simple reason, because it is all about salvation. It is about the salvation of souls. It is about the eternal destiny of uh, the people of God, that hopefully uh, we can do our little bit of share, uh, helping people make it uh, to heaven. Now, I want to point out here, where, where the Lord, well, has commanded us, first of all. Uh, it's not just a suggestion. It is a command. But he, he says here, I have made you a light to the Gentiles. I have made you. So what this basically should tell us and assure us, this is God's work in us. It's not just some good work that we thought uh, it would be nice to do this work. But... It is God acting in and through us. And it is God who makes us a light to the nations so that we can be an instrument of his salvation. Why does God do that? Do that to fulfill his very plan. And, and what is his very plan? Again, it's all about salvation. The very reason why the Father sent his son Jesus into the world to suffer, to die for us, to win for us our salvation. And so this continuing work is entrusted by Jesus to you and I. Before he ascended into heaven, he commissioned his disciples and by extension, all of, his, uh, all of those who uh, profess to be his disciples. And we are to continue his divine work. So, even just thinking about that, you know, you, you need to bring that to mind, bring that to prayer every now and then, uh, and have that conviction. Uh, God is working in us. God intends his, his very own plan to be fulfilled. And what we are doing is uh, divine work. How... Can we truly become God's instruments of salvation? Or for, for any Christian, for any Catholic for that matter? Because the, the core for everyone is the same. It's the fullness of the life of Christ. And the fullness of the life of Christ includes doing the very work that uh, he did. In fact, uh, we do belong to a missionary church. And mission is at the core of uh, uh, what the church uh, is. So... How, how can God fulfill his very plan in and through us? Well, we need three things. We need to be saved, to be sanctified, and to be sent. And indeed, that is what God does uh, to people that he calls, who, who is basically, again, everyone. You know? They need to be saved, they are sanctified, and then they are sent. This is God's plan for, for all. We... Look to the very uh, plan of God as we look at the Bible, the very first book of the, of the Bible, and what was the original plan of God. Well, he created the whole universe, and then he created humankind, Adam and Eve, and he placed them in Eden. And it was a perfect existence. No sin, no pollution, no crime, <laughs> no, no corruption of, of other people. And they had everything uh, that they could ever, ever need. Uh, well, maybe they were not yet corrupted by the world today. 
where people think they need so many so many, much more of the world's goods even though they don't really need them uh, and it's very difficult to really try to live a simple lifestyle but in eden it was simple but it was perfect and they walked and they talked and they related to uh, walk and talked with god and related to 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 him you know? but we all know uh, uh, paradise was uh, lost and they were sent out of uh, eden and so the descendants up to our time we are all children of adam and eve we now live in a valley of tears so very very different from uh, eden you know? but even as we are living now in a valley of tears there is something to look forward to precisely because of jesus sacrifice on the cross precisely because he already won for us our salvation and what we look forward to is the new eden once again a perfect place perfect and and where uh, all that are there are holy and where uh, those who make it there will actually commune with god and have that that uh, ongoing uh, uh, relationship uh, with him and that is heaven that is the new eden that's the new uh, jerusalem now, unfortunately, in the world today, there are many lost souls. I mean, uh, that's why we have our mission in the first place, right? So the reality is there are many lost souls. And for the souls that are lost, they're not going to make it to heaven. And worse, they face an eternity in uh, hell. Now, there are some in our church who say, uh, no, there is no hell. God is good. God will not, uh, the, the love and mercy of God will not allow him to condemn anyone to eternal price of hell. Well, God does not want that. God wants everyone to be saved. Precisely, that's why he sent his very own son Jesus into the world. No? But we condemn ourselves. If we do not obey God, if we do not live, live the way of God, uh, if we persist in living in, in sin. So when when people say there is no hell, that is a great disservice. Ne never accept that. That is, that is a false uh, uh, statement that is being uh, given. Because if there is no hell, then for many, well, there is no need to reform their lives. Just eat, drink, and be happy. And there's nothing to be afraid of that you die in sin and you go to hell. There's no hell. So that is a disservice. Now, of course, the reality is we should want to amend our lives because we love God. But the reality also is, you know, it takes a while before you uh, attain to that level of holiness where really you live a, a, a righteous life simply because you love Christ. Whether there are rewards like heaven, whether there are... Uh, uh, there's condemnation like, like in hell because we love Christ, then we live a righteous life. But for many people, they, they need that kind of, uh, of uh, threat which becomes an encouragement. You don't want to end up there, so you better amend your life. So to say there is no hell is a great disservice. Uh, then there are also those who say, well, if you have not led a good life in this life and you die, you will just disappear. Just disappear. Poof. You're gone. So again, that's a great disservice. So it, it's like saying, well, you really have nothing to worry about. When you die, you, you, you've really enjoyed yourself in this life with all the, the great sins of the flesh that people commit. Uh, and don't worry. And then, anyway, when you die, okay, that's just the end of life. You're gone. You, you disappear into, into thin air. So that, again, that's not true. No? There are consequences to how we live our uh, lives. And we cannot just uh, look to the pleasures of earth without realizing that, yes, there are consequences if those pleasures are wrong or even uh, evil. So there are many uh, lost souls. Now, there are also many who have been saved by the blood of Jesus, 
but are not necessarily sanctified. Now, uh, uh, for many of us, we were baptized as infants. When we uh, are, uh, when we were baptized, when you you are baptized, sacrament of baptism, then original sin is cleansed, and we are uh, we are clean. You know? And and at that point, we are saved. And and uh, that that is that is important. You know? that we're cleansed of the original sin of our uh, parents and that we become right with God. That's why as an infant uh, in the church, uh, usually for in other places they might have uh, baptism much uh, later on, but uh, for us, uh, it is as uh, infants. So we are saved. But that is just a start. Yes, you are saved, but you need to grow. You need to grow in holiness. You need continuing transformation. And in fact, the reality is, if you are not moving forward, then there is a real threat that you will slide backwards. So in the Christian life, it cannot just be that, okay, you know, I, I realized my sins, I repented of it, I went to confession, and now I'm trying to, to uh, not commit sin. But we are just static there. In that situation, we're not moving on to greater di discipleship, to deeper relationship with God, to, again, what we call uh, holiness. And if that's the case, there will always be the danger of backsliding. Because the, the evil one uh, is always there, trying to bring us down. Because the world that we live in, uh, we are in the world, but we're not of it. But the world that we live, live in... <laughs> Is uh, still, all, still always trying to entice us uh, with the pleasures of the world, and uh, we still have the uh, weakened human flesh that is in us. So you need to keep moving uh, forward in order not to backslide. Now, further, it's important that we people be sanctified. Because there is so much more that the church can do if she has saints. I mean, God, God can use uh, anyone, but since we are doing divine work, then the more that we are in line with the ways of God, with the mind of, of Christ, you know, uh, docile to the Holy Spirit, uh, living lives of purity and, and righteousness, the more that that is, the more saintly we are, then, since we are doing God's divine work, then we can be much more uh, effective in, in that work. So the church can do so much more. Yeah. And then in the third aspect, being sent, there are also many who do not know they are sent. So they might have been saved, and they're being sanctified. They're really trying to live a a good and holy life, but they don't know they have not been, that they have been sent. They are just basically living, okay, minding their own business or minding the business of God, uh, looking to holiness in day-to-day -day life, but not going out there uh, to do something for many others within the work of uh, the church. There are those people who think, well, if I try to live a clean life, uh, avoid sin, then that, that's, that's okay. That's good enough. That's what it's about. Avoid sin, avoid hell. No, no, uh, it's not. You might make it to heaven, but uh, that's not what the fullness of Christian life is all about. Because God does have his intent, and he uses those who are saved and who are being sanctified to reach others. Remember what Jesus said when he looked around and saw the people like sheep without a shepherd and his, his heart was moved with pity? And what did he say? The, the, the harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to pray to send more laborers. That's what the church needs. There really is so much work that needs to be done. But uh, the, the people of God, uh, even those who are already saved and and being sanctified needs to realize that, yes, I, you, uh, each and everyone will have a part to play. 
I just need to look for for what, what gift the Lord has given me uh, and how I can make use of that gift in order to participate in the life and mission of uh, the church. So the more that the more Christians, Catholics uh, do that, the more the people of God, the more the disciples of Jesus, and the more that they are growing in sanctification, then the greater the work that can be done. So saved, sanctified, uh, and sent. In a way that con uh, conforms to what we've also been hearing about in the work of LCSC, that is meeting and knowing Christ, that is living Christ, and that is sharing Christ. To be saved, you need to meet Jesus in a new way. Now, we're not talking of infants that were baptized as infants. We're talking of uh, adults who have lived their lives. And like most of us, uh, have lived our lives perhaps in sin, in a variety of sin. Uh, and so we need to, to once again uh, be, be saved. Uh, to, uh, and that happens when we meet and we get to know Christ, when we encounter Christ and we would start to enter into a personal relationship with him. Then, as we do that, we are sanctified. We are further transformed. Uh, we grow in knowledge of, of, of God. Uh, and so we, we live Christ. And then, again, uh, we need to be sent, and that is when we share Christ. That's what you call a virtuous circle. Someone meets Christ, will live Christ, and then will share Christ. And when he or she shares Christ, then someone else will meet Christ, will live Christ, and will also share Christ. So that's a virtuous uh, cycle. And the intent of God uh, in all of this can break down if any of the three are not in place. So if we are not saved, by the way, you can be saved, but you can fall back again into sin. You can backslide. And that's how you always need to strive hard uh, for that holiness moving forward. Uh, but God's intent breaks down if any of the three are missing for someone who is not saved or for someone who is saved but is not growing in sanctification. Growing in holiness, striving for Christian perfection. And then, thirdly, if uh, someone does not understand that he or she is sent, and that does, does not go. <laughs> it's, it's just there within the church, within the kingdom of God, but it's not doing uh, mission uh, for Christ. So the three are very, very important and crucial. And now I'll take a closer look at each of those. Because uh, this is also what our uh, theme is uh, all about for this year. So first of all, being saved. Again, what is God's intent? God's intent is salvation for all. God does not want anyone to be lost. God wants everyone to be able to make it to heaven, to be in eternal communion with him. How does it happen that uh, we encounter salvation? Through Jesus. Jesus is uh, the Savior. But then Jesus makes use of human instruments. Okay? So that's crucial. That, that is now our role. That, that's how all of this now uh, relates to, to, to us. Jesus is the Savior. He is the one Savior. We do not add anything to his saving act. His saving act was complete. When people accept the salvation Jesus won for them on the cross, then they are saved. And, and uh, 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 they, they, there's still a lot of transformation that needs to happen. But at that point, when they repent of sin and turn to faith in Jesus, then they are, they are uh, saved. But in, in this, Jesus has done his work. And Jesus has gone up to heaven. He will return once again. But in the meantime, he has left the work to us. And of course, he has not abandoned us. He said that I will be with you until the end of the age. And that is by the Holy Spirit. 
So the Holy Spirit is given to us, but for us to be able to do Jesus' work, for us to continue with that work, uh, for us to be effective instruments in, in that work. Now, Jesus, of course, is perfect. We are not. That, that should be obvious. But, and this is the amazing thing. This is the mysterious thing. This is one thing why we praise and thank God for the great privilege. So Jesus is perfect. We are not. But he uses us, God uses us for the same divine purpose. But that's why, as I have said uh, earlier, we need to be formed. We need to be to strive to be like Jesus. In fact, we need to be another Christ. And we strive for Christian perfection. So be made perfect as Heavenly Father is, is perfect. So the raw material God uses us, we are made in his image when God created. And Adam and Eve, uh, when they were created, when they were in Eden, they were perfect until they, they sinned. So we are made in God's image, but we are, are, are weak, we are, we are fallen, uh, we are disobedient, we are rebellious, and this has been the history of God's people from Adam and Eve and throughout salvation history with his chosen people, Israel, and uh, with the Christians of today, that has been the uh, situation. We are far from the perfection, uh, obviously, but, but that God intends for, for all of us. So there needs to be transformation so that God can make use of us before he can really make full use and of the greatest effectiveness in using us, then there needs to be uh, transformation. So how are we saved? How are we put on that, uh, shall we say, on, on that track? No? Uh, God's track. How are we put on that? Well, by the, by the blood of the Lamb. And again, the, that's the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He shed his precious blood. Uh, he was the perfect lamb for the sacrifice, the only uh, acceptable offering uh, to pay for our sins. And that's what actually actually uh, happened. So the, the central and, and the central point of our faith is indeed the, the uh, sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That's what that's what everything is all about. That's the very foundation. Uh, that is what is always represented by, by crucifixes in our homes or crucifix at dangling at the end of our rosary, part of the rosary. Uh, so that is the uh, central event. Now again, there are those who say that, well, it's okay just to be a good person and to be of any religion. And no, that's not correct. We need Christ. And, and, and only Christ is the, is the Savior. Uh, what does it say in Acts 4 verse 12? There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. No other name. It is only Christ. Salvation is only in Christ. Salvation is only in the redeeming act of Jesus on the cross. And so, again, it is a great disservice when people say, well, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really matter what your religion is. Just be a good person. No, that's, that's not so. Only those who are saved are those who put their faith in Jesus and call upon his, his name. As to other religions, no, they, they are not ways to the, to the divine. And Jesus established only one church, and that is the uh, Christian uh, church. And, and in particular, Jesus established the church on Peter. And Peter 
functioned as uh, first pope, then followed by Linus, and then uh, all the other popes uh, up to today where we have Pope Francis. That is the, the one true church of Jesus. That is the only authentic church in the only authentic religion, which is uh, Christianity. So, now there, there, there was uh, uh, only one church that Jesus established, and for uh, the, the first uh, uh, centuries, there was only one church until well the major there, there were some some schisms and splits uh, uh, centuries after the establishment by jesus of his church but the major one came a thousand years later uh, when the uh, western and eastern church uh, separated so the eastern are the orthodox churches you know, and the western uh, the catholic church and then 500 years later half a millennium later uh, martin luther split off and the protestant reformation and so since that time many many more uh, christian denominations have come upon upon the, the the scene but jesus only established one church and that church uh, today is the uh, catholic church you know, with again with a succession of heads uh, whom we call popes starting with Peter. One thing that is distinctive with this Catholic Church, and this is where we, we can also see how that salvation is related to just to this, this one true church. One of the distinctive aspects is the Eucharist. And, and the church has always had uh, the Eucharist. Of course, the, the present form developed through the uh, centuries. And the, the most distinctive feature of the Eucharist is the transformation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus, which we then uh, receive. And many of the Protestants who were Catholics before, who accepted that as uh, certainly a, a truth, uh, no longer believe that it is actually the body and blood of Jesus. And they might have a communion service uh, and there's a breaking of the bread and a sharing of the bread, but that's just what it is. It's a, it's a community thing uh, rather than the uh, great mystery of uh, transubstantiation. But what about the Eucharist now? How, how is that so crucial to being, being saved? Well, we read in John 6, verse 53, Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you do not have life within you. So, unless you eat the flesh and drink his blood you do not have life within you and we know that that happens uh, today uh, in the form of bread and wine as it did in the uh, last uh, supper you know, when when jesus consecrated the the bread and the wine uh, that wasn't yet his uh, body and blood he still needed to go to the cross and to shed that blood but that is the uh, celebration of that event on Calvary, where, uh, again, we uh, Jesus won for us our uh, salvation. And then in the next verse, in verse 54, Jesus says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the third day. Okay? So that's even clearer, because in verse 53, it says, Unless you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you do not have life within you but in this verse jesus says that life is eternal life when you eat my flesh and drink my blood you will have eternal life and i will raise you on the last day so on the last day is the start of our eternal life of course we might uh, uh, have to spend some time in purgatory 
but that's already uh, the the gateway to 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 heaven and so that's already part of that uh, eternal life that we can look forward to but here jesus is saying the eucharist is about salvation it is about making it to eternal life then in again in the next verse verse uh, 55 for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink so th that's where our theology of the eucharist uh, with, with some other passages in the bible uh, would be coming from and and that bread that that wine actually is transformed into the flesh into the body of jesus into the blood of uh, jesus and of course there were there were many who could not accept that and maybe we could say who, who can blame them oh, sure sounds like cannibalism to me <laughs> so uh, they said this teaching is hard we cannot accept it and they left jesus but that's the teaching even today there are many who don't accept it even within our church there are clerics who they, they might not say it openly but but or they say it privately uh, or theologians that no longer believe this and they're going the way of the protestants who as catholics used to believe it but now no longer do but this is the reality this is what jesus himself says as written in the very word of god and then in verse 58 he says again whoever eats this bread will live forever so there you have uh, it brothers and sisters when we talk of uh, salvation it is uh, by the blood of the the lamb and it happens uh, through the um, the uh, ministry of the church the only the only one church that jesus himself established the catholic church and as we celebrate the eucharist as we take holy communion worthily of course then we are assured of uh, eternal life then we are indeed saved then we indeed will make it to to heaven so that's being saved. Now let's move on to being sanctified. And that's a call to holiness. And we often speak about that. Uh, unfortunately, it's not spoken of much uh, in the church. You don't really hear that many sermons about it. Or uh, even in church conferences. Uh, you, you hear a lot about many other things, but not so much about holiness. But this is of crucial importance. This is at the very core of uh, the uh, call uh, to be the, the people of God. Now, the path to holiness is a lifelong process. Again, the intent is to be holy as God is holy, uh, to strive to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. And that's never going to uh, happen in full, 100% uh, in, this, in this life. And the fullness of that will only happen when we are purified in purgatory. So in purgatory, we will be purified and uh, every trace of, of uh, sin and anything that is not of God will be uh, fired up away until we are pure, we are perfect, and then we enter into, into heaven. Now, the process of purification aside from after we die or when jesus returns once again and we're in purgatory is precisely the christian life the life that we have in the here and now that that lifelong process of sanctification is what happens as we live our christian lives as we live it in christ as we live christ more and more in our day-to-day -day lives so we're talking of uh, transformation continuing uh, transformation now god as we, we have seen god saved us and sanctifies us 
to be able to use us. Okay? But since we are not, well, I, I had spoken earlier that uh, the, the more that we are saintly, then the more that we can effectively do what is divine work. So, how about right now? Since we say we are sinners, and indeed we are sinners, can God use us? Of course, the answer is yes. And, uh, and we will we'll take a, a closer look at that, especially in the third part, being sent. But you need to be careful of the deception of the enemy. You know, you know that uh, uh, the, devi uh, the devil, is uh, Satan, is the father of lies. Uh, he, he lied to, to, to Eve uh, to get her to partake of the forbidden fruit. Uh, so he is all, all about uh, deception. And one of the lies of the enemy is to say to us, to you and I, you're a sinner. How can you be worthy of doing God's work? Now, especially as we understand what God's work is. Because you, you can help the poor. And okay, we, we know that even atheists, even great sinners, uh, they can go do good things for the poor. But when we're talking of salvation, when we're talking of the very divine work of God, then the more that we understand that, the more that we could be susceptible to the deception of the evil one who tells us, you're not worthy because you're a sinner. Don't be proud. Don't, 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 don't uh, think that uh, uh, you, you can do uh, even a little bit of the divine work of God. You're, you're, you're a sinner. So just be careful of that temptation because we, we see and we're going to see that uh, the reality is, yes, God can use us and God does use us. In fact, he can, he can use uh, sinners, even pagans, when we see the history of salvation. Uh, he, he used uh, uh, pagans like Cyrus to, to help restore uh, the, the chosen people, uh, uh, Israel, uh, to, to Jerusalem. So, yes, we, as, as long as we uh, have been saved, and we are in the process of being sanctified, but we're not quite there. Some are nearer, some are farther, but all of us are not quite there. But God can use us. Take a look at what the apostles, the 12, and then the disciples of Jesus, the 72, were able to do. They were given power over demons. Now, they were sinners just like us, but they were empowered by God to be able to do that work, to come against the enemy and, and, and uh, have power over demons. They, they expelled uh, demons. Jesus even used Judas, who turned out to be a traitor, who turned out to be a betrayer, who turned his back on, on Jesus, what worst thing can you do? Especially when you are already a disciple, and especially if you are in the most inner core group of Jesus, and then you betrayed him. What could be worse by, by, by than that? But before that happened, he was one of the 12, and he was also being used by Jesus. And I suppose that he, together with the others, were also expelling demons. So, we see sinners can be used. We, too, uh, can be used. And, and that's what you and I actually experience. We still go to confession. We still fall. But we know that we are able to do uh, good things by the grace of God, power of the uh, Holy Spirit. We can be used by, by God. Now, what is important, again, is the greater effectiveness. So the, the purer the vessel, because we are doing divine work, then the more that God can 
effectively make use of us. Uh, le le let's take a look at, at that. Uh, Peter, uh, Paul, Paul, in his letter to Timothy, in his uh, second letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verses 20 to 21. Let's read well, what it says there. In a large household, now, you take that, that's the church, as far as we are concerned. In a large household, there are vessels not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for lofty and others for humble use. So in, in a household, uh, obviously the gold and silver are for lofty use, and the wooden clay uh, for more humble uh, use. Maybe it's like uh, for the rich people, if uh, you know they have honored guests, then they bring out the really fine china. If it's just ordinary guests, okay, paper, uh, the, the plastic plates will do, <laughs> maybe even paper plates. So in, in a household, it, it achieves the same purpose. Food is placed there and you partake of the food, the food still tastes the same, but uh, there, there are vessels for lofty use and vessels for humble use. Continuing on. If anyone cleanses himself of these things, and Paul is referring to evil things that he's talking about prior to that, he will be a vessel for lofty use. Okay, see that? So when, when we're just starting out, maybe we're like uh, clay. No? Could, could actually crumble. No? And you, you drop uh, a clay plate and it, it crumbles. But we're being used for, for humble use. No? But if we continue to cleanse ourselves of sin in our life, he will be a I, I'm reading, he will be a vessel for lofty use, dedicated beneficial to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So, who is the master of the house? Jesus. What is the good work or the great test work that we're able to do? Well, that's what we've been talking about. The work of evangelization leading to helping uh, uh, people uh, take on the salvation that Jesus won for them on the cross and then helping them uh, to be able to continue to grow and to grow in, in holiness. So we, we can be a vessel for love to use to, so that we're more beneficial to the master. What needs to happen for that to be the case? Well, in the next verse, verse 22, says, uh, Paul says to Timothy, So turn from youthful desires and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord with purity of heart. So there you are, continuing transformation, growing in holiness and righteousness, being more and more like, like Jesus, growing in faith, learning uh, authentic uh, Christian love, the very love of Christ that loves even, even enemies. Being at peace, relating, be, uh, having right relationships with, with others, having purity of heart. So all of this are, are part of growing in the Lord, of, of being transformed more and more into uh, a person of uh, greater holiness and ultimately into another Christ. So to be sanctified is a call to holiness, is to be like Christ. It is to be uh, saints. And part of that is the call to discipleship. Because how we become like Christ is when we work at being the disciples of Christ. What is the relationship with the master and the disciple? The master teaches and the disciple learns. And he, he walks in the footsteps of the, of the master. He listens to his words. And, and uh, he, he is told to, to do things. So uh, he is corrected. 
uh, he's encouraged, he's inspired. So all of these things happen. So it, it's about discipleship. And discipleship is such an amazing call because it is following in the very footsteps of Jesus. And of course, we know, those who are also who have strived to be authentic disciples, that it is a very demanding call. Why? Because it's to be like Christ. That's the hardest thing in the world. In fact, we, we might say, oh, how can that be? It is uh, totally impossible. We're not God. But it is God who says, be holy. As he is holy, be perfect as Heavenly Father is perfect. And so that's what God's intent is. And he will provide whatever it is that, that we need. Uh, and that's what we are called to be. But it's going to be very, very demanding. So what needs to happen when we talk of discipleship? Well, we've looked at this verse uh, quite a number of times. Uh, it's one definition of discipleship, Luke 9, verse 23, where Jesus says, if you, anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross uh, daily and follow me. So how, how can we grow to be authentic disciples? We deny ourselves. It's all about Jesus. It's all about pleasing Jesus. It's all about being at his beck and call, at his disposal, to, uh, to, to uh, be, be, be formed by him, uh, to not have our own preferences, or agenda, or, or uh, what we consider to be our own pleasures. It's always looking to Christ. So deny yourself in order that you can take on uh, the very life of Christ, which, by, by the way, so, was also a life of uh, self-denial. And then it is embrace of the cross. And, and we, we've always said that crosses will come in, in life, but the question is whether it will turn us against God because he doesn't answer our, seemingly doesn't answer our prayer, or it will make us closer to God as we recognize the discipline that is allowing to happen in our lives and as we recognize our total dependence upon him and uh, as we recognize the great privilege of sharing in his cross, albeit in a very uh, small way. And then to follow him is all about total obedience. Just obey. No ifs, no buts. Understand what is the word of God, what Jesus, is, Jesus teaches, and just obey. Live your life uh, accordingly. Now, there were other aspects uh, that uh, we, we can read in the Bible about uh, what it means to be a disciple or a follower of uh, Jesus. Uh, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 9, verses 57 to 62, you have three would-be followers of Jesus. So, people who were saying, I want to, to follow you. So, the first one said, I will follow you wherever you go. And what Jesus told him, him was, uh, well, foxes have dens, birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. So right then and there, Jesus is telling them, it's not going to be an easy life. There will be sacrifices to be made. There will be hardships. And as we begin to understand, there will even be a lot of uh, opposition, oppression, and persecution. There can be suffering, there can be pain. And maybe the least of your worries will be to have no place to lay your head. But it will entail some sacrifice. So Jesus does not call us on false pretenses and, and saying, you know, if you follow me, then uh, everything will be grand. This is what the proclaimers of the prosperity gospel say. As long as you follow Jesus, you commit to Jesus. And of course, if you give your tithe, as long as you, you do that, then you will have a great life full of blessings. Just, just blessings. That's not necessarily the case. Unless, of course, we understand that even the hardships and difficulties are blessings because they feel, fulfill the very purposes of God. And then there was the second uh, man uh, who said, uh, when Jesus told him, follow me, he, he said, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their 
dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, that man, either his father had just died and he wanted to attend, uh, attend to the burial of the father, or the father was still alive and he wanted to remain with the father until he died. Then he could follow Jesus. And uh, Jesus, what Jesus was saying is, well, if you're being called, you just need to respond. And there are many things that are important in life. Certainly, wanting to bury your father or wanting to remain with your father until uh, he dies to help support him. Uh, but there's also the call of the Lord. Now, we, of course, don't abandon, abandon our family responsibilities. It depends on, on each one's circumstances. But the most important thing, when you are called and, and you've already professed, I'm, I'm going to follow you, then you go. Go and follow and proclaim the kingdom of God. Then there was a third person who said, I will follow you, but let me say farewell to my family at home. And what you said to him, no one who looks, who sets a hand to the plow and looks what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. So again, here is uh, someone who, yes, okay, Lord, I hear your call. I want to respond to your call. I will follow you. But let me go have some time with my family first. Uh, they, they, they will give me a send-off party. And I want to cherish the time with them. All of that is important. Those of you who go off to work in some other country in order to support your families and you need to leave your family behind, you know what that is all about. So that is important. But again, Jesus is telling them, if you have made the decision to, to follow, then there are things that you really need to leave behind. It might be family. It might be livelihood. It might be comfort. It might be convenience. It might be uh, uh, positions, authority. Whatever it might be, you be ready to go and be a follower. So it's quite demanding. Yeah. And we also can see from this that we need to have clear priorities. And what is that? But Jesus is number one. His work is number one. Following him is number one. Everything else follows beyond that. Now, remember, Jesus is not, is not unreasonable. And when we give ourselves to him, then uh, he, he already gave himself to us beforehand. He's committed to help us. When we do less for our family because we need to do service, even outside of the home, he actually is the one taking care of their, our family, even without us. Unless the Lord, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain uh, who build it. But you should not let go of your hard-earned rest because the Lord gives to his beloved even in sleep. So that's how the, the, the Lord is. So it will never be a neglect of family or livelihood uh, uh, responsibilities. But it is just having clear priorities. God, first and foremost, everything else uh, second. Take a look at what Jesus says. In Luke 14, verse 26, he said, If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Oh, what words are those? What does it mean? Will I, will I hate my closest relatives? Well, no, that's not what Jesus is saying. In the Semitic language, to hate just means to love less. You know? and, and anyway, what Jesus is emphasizing here is if you love them more than you love me in your response to my call to discipleship, you cannot be my disciple. Why? Because your priorities will not be me and my priorities. I'm second. So, this is again emphasizing, clear priority, it is Jesus. It is not even the closest uh, family members, uh, parents or, or children or siblings. Now, obviously, we are to love them. No? And we are to live out our responsibilities to, to them. But the priority is, is clear. Then in verse 33, Jesus says, In the same way, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. 
There, there he is. This was again going. We cannot be his disciple unless we renounce all of our possessions. Well, it does not literally mean that you know you you if, if, even though that that could happen as well. That's what happened with the rich young man, if you know the story, and this uh, good uh, young man who was obeying the commandments but wanted more. And uh, Jesus, seeing the desire in his heart, said, well, if you want to be perfect, uh, sell what you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. So that was literally, uh, physically, letting go of all of his possessions. But what, again, that, that this means for us is we cannot be uh, subservient to possessions, to material things, to mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. And they cannot be our priority. And for many people, that is the priority. Mm -hmm. And they cannot serve because, well, I, I have my job, I have my livelihood, I, I have my business, I have to do this, I have to do that, and so many other, other things. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus speaks in very strong terms and says, if you don't renounce, but meaning to say that unless you make subservient to me, to your, to your uh, making me number one priority, uh, any material possessions that you have in life, then how can you be my disciple? Again, it's a question of having clear priorities. And then back to verse 27. Jesus says, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So there will be crosses in life, and you carry your own cross. That cross is precisely for you. And Jesus, Jesus knows what we can bear. At times, you know, it seems our crosses are so heavy. How can I bear this? And, and we cry out to God. And that is part of God's intent, that precisely we cry out to Him. And to realize that, uh, you know, apart from Him, we are nothing, but in Him is our strength. And, and the power of God can, can uh, be uh, in us. But... The, the crosses are uh, perfectly suited that God allows in our lives that we can bear, thinking we cannot bear, but we can actually bear them. And when we bear them, when we carry and embrace our crosses, then, as we have been saying, that is how we can be uh, brought closer to, to Jesus, and that's how we can be further purified and continue to grow on that uh, process of uh, sanctification. So, brothers and sisters, a master teaches and forms his disciples. And we are uh, in such a process, so that's Jesus, we are the disciples. Uh, and in that process, we begin to think and be like him. We take on his mind, we take on, on his heart, and of course we take on his uh, very uh, divine work. So when we do that, then that's when we grow in holiness. That's when we are sanctified. Okay, third thing. So saved, then sanctified in order to be sent. Uh, and of course, I say three things that's not necessarily uh, one after the other in progression. You, you, you do need to be saved. And then you enter into the process of sanctification uh, so that you be, can be more effective when you are sent. But as we have seen, even if we're still being sanctified, we are still uh, sinners as we certainly are, we are already sent. We can already do uh, good uh, according to the ways of God. Uh, so that, that is all entirely up uh, to God. But we are saved, we are sanctified, then we are sent. Sent where? Into war. We are sent into war. Why? Because we are sent to proclaim the gospel. That is uh, the, the great commission. Proclaim the gospel of salvation in Jesus to all of uh, creation. We are sent to share Christ. We are among those workers that are to bring in that, that harvest. And we are sent in order to make uh, disciples. Uh, go and make disciples of all the nations. Now, when you do that, 
when you proclaim the gospel of salvation, when you talk about Jesus Christ and sharing him to a darkened world, uh, people with darkened minds, when you strive to uh, convert them, to make them disciples, then that's where you get engaged in spiritual war. Why? Because the whole world is under the dominion of the evil one. And uh, many of those that need to be saved, that's why we're sent uh, to them, are under the dominion of the evil one. And so the evil one does not give up very easily what is his dominion. And so when we do these things, when we proclaim Christ, we automatically get engaged in spiritual warfare. That, that spiritual warfare uh, started with uh, Lucifer. So God created uh, everything, uh, the whole universe. God created also the, the angels. And uh, we know what uh, uh, happened, that uh, Lucifer, the foremost uh, angel, possibly the most powerful angel uh, there was at, at that point, wanted to be God. So he rebelled. And, and uh, the book of Revelation tells us, then war broke out in, in heaven. Uh, of course, he was defeated by Michael, another uh, angel, and they were thrown out of uh, heaven. And Lucifer became Satan, and the angels that went with him became uh, demons. So they started with Lucifer. And then, so spiritual war is what actually happened, uh, as Revelation says. Then war broke out in heaven. And then there was Eden, and that was more of a subversive war, a silent war, uh, not not. Uh, uh, an uh, open warfare of two uh, forces uh, in combat with one another, with swords drawn. You know? So that was more uh, spy stuff. You know? So uh, the, the devil quietly uh, working and influencing uh, Eve. And then, of course, uh, uh, Adam. You know? But that's, that was war. That was what happened in, in Eden. The serpent made war on God, wanted to destroy what God had just created, wanted to, to upend and usurp the, the wonderful situation that was prevailing in the kingdom of God. That was an assault, an assault on God's design, on an assault on God's creatures. So that was, that was war. And then... Uh, Jesus, that was also a spiritual war where, where, where the, the enemy uh, certainly uh, knew what was, what was to happen and uh, in a futile attempt, he tried to prevent that from happening and of course he thought he won when he finally got uh, everyone, you know, the... the uh, apostles, uh, disciples abandoning uh, Jesus, you know, uh, Peter denying him, Judas uh, betraying him, uh, and and so uh, everyone now the 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 Romans, the the Sanhedrin, uh, the uh, the Jewish uh, leaders, and even the Jewish people all uh, coming against uh, Jesus. And the people shouting, crucify him and release Barabbas, but crucify uh, Jesus. That was a direct assault. That was, that was war. The war that Satan waged against Jesus. And he thought he had succeeded when Jesus was crucified. And then Jesus died. And of course, we know that on the third day he rose again. And it was actually Satan who was already defeated. And his, the, the head of the serpent was crushed. And then there is the history of the church. So uh, uh, Jesus had established his church and on uh, the day of uh, Pentecost, uh, Peter preached that sermon where 3,000 were converted and they formed a church. 
the community of disciples. And the history of the church has always been an assault by the evil one in many different ways, including the schisms and the, the separations and the persecution of the church and the assaults and uh, all the uh, many other things that have happened, including up to, the, to this day, uh, the so-called isms, uh, including uh, modernism. So this is continuing assault. So it's all about war. Take a look at the call of the 12, when Jesus actually called them, the, the 12 uh, apostles. In Matthew 10, verse 1, we read, Then he summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. So, what, what, were, what were they called to do? What were they given authority and power to do? They had authority over the demons, over the unclean spirits, to drive them out, to expel them from the lives of uh, people, and to cure every disease and illness. So here is now uh, the counter assault, the direct assault of God, of his church, of Jesus who formed his, uh, his core group, and then later on, of course, uh, the 72, and then, of course, now the Christian church, uh, to directly assault demons and drive them out of people, you know, removing their dominion over people so in order to bring them into the kingdom. And then even the healing of the sick was an assault on demonic activity. Because what is illness? What are the, these things that are wrong with people, whether it's physical, mental, uh, physiological, psychological, emotional, or whatever? Uh, ultimately, it is a result of sin. And it is the work of the evil one. So when, when the uh, apostles were able to heal the sick, they were overcoming the effects of sin. So that's an assault on the uh, direct assault on the enemy. It's an assault on the kingdom of the, the, the devil. The, the uh, devil the, and the dark side in turn continually assaults uh, us and assaults uh, the church. Uh, he always wreaks havoc as we have seen. You know? in the uh, uh, history of the church, the history of salvation, and even in the church today. We've talked of apostasy, uh, 99 of the 100 are lost, and uh, losing Catholics by the day, so it's wreaking havoc within uh, the church. So that assault continues. We need to defend against that assault, but we also need to go on the offensive. You cannot just be defensive. The, in fact, even in war, actual war, uh, it is said that the uh, best defense is offense. Go on the offensive. And how do we do that? By our work of evangelization. And by doing it rapid, massive, and worldwide. In this work, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit of Jesus. Jesus himself drove out, drove out demons. The, the, the 12 drove out demons. And later on, the, the 72, let's see. They, they also did the same thing. In Luke 10, verse says uh, 17 to 18, they were sent out on practicum uh, by Jesus. So the 72 returned rejoicing and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us because of your name. Jesus said, I have observed Satan fall like lightning from the sky. And the first time he observed that was uh, in that uh, great war in heaven where Michael defeated uh, Lucifer and Lucifer was uh, tossed out of heaven you know, and fell out of the sky. 
But as Jesus also expelled demons, so he ceases in the work of the 12, and now in the work of the 72, uh, the same thing has happened. So this is what it's all about. This is what being sent is. It is about engaging in spiritual war. Unfortunately, many Catholics do not know about being sent to war. And it's doubly, well, that, that's unfortunate because then uh, they do not enlist in the army of God. But that is doubly unfortunate because this war that they might not be engaged in, that they might not even know about, certainly seriously affects them. They are the victims in this war. They are the ones being assaulted by the enemy. And, and many of them don't even realize they've already been taken captives. They're already in the, firmly in the enemy camp. So Catholics, the people of God, need to engage. We need to engage in this war. Okay, brothers and sisters, so we are saved. We continue to be sanctified and we are sent. And again, the other way of looking at that, we are to meet and know Christ, we are to live Christ, and we are to share Christ. The call to holiness is the call to be a saint, the call to, to war is the call to be a soldier. We are called to be saints and soldiers, saintly soldiers. Soldiering saints, or as we prefer to say it, holy warriors. We are called to be holy warriors. And in this, in this uh, war, we are already assured of the victory. Because again, Jesus and Mama Mary crushed the head of the serpent. Uh, through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, through his death and his resurrection. And we, as the people of God, share in that victory. And I want to close with this passage from the book of Revelation. So the Revelation, uh, a lot of it uh, talking about the end of time. Yeah. And first of all, in Revelation 19, verse 11, the vision of John. Then I saw the heavens open, and there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True. He judges and wages war in righteousness. I was talking about Jesus. But but what, what does he see? He sees this, well, a, a rider on a white horse, a, a warrior who wages war in righteousness. The first and foremost, holy warrior. God is a warrior. And, and Jesus uh, is the one who engaged the enemy you know, and defeated the enemy on the cross. And, and John is given a vision of that. The vision at the end of time, the victorious Christ comes as a holy warrior. Engaged in war. And that's why we see in verses 13 to 14, he wore a cloak that had been dipped in blood and his name was called the Word of God. The armies of heaven followed, followed him, mounted on white horses and wearing clean white linen. So he is Jesus, mounted on a white horse, bearing his... his uh, uh, sword, uh, his cloak dipped in blood, waging war in righteousness. And who follows Jesus? The armies of heaven. The holy ones, the angels. And that includes, uh, should include us, the armies that are here, waging a war right here in, in the world. And, and the armies of heaven followed him and we too, mounted on white horses and wearing clean white linen. That talks about purity. That talks about holiness. That talks about righteousness. So these, uh, these soldiers 
this army of God wearing clean white linen. You're talking about holy warriors. Amen.